Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. And um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk today. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm learning so far today is that we have some answers, but we have lots more questions. And I'm going to continue that theme and, and talk about the area of congenital malformations. And what I'm going to try to do today is really give you an overview of how um, uh, various researchers are, are trying to approach uh, the, uh, the understanding of, of the genetic causes of, of congenital malformations um, in this new era of genomic medicine. And so we'll talk about some approaches that are being used and some approaches that could be used. Uh, and the goal is really not to give you uh, any sort of in-depth information about any specific malformation, but really more of a sense of what's happening. Uh, so I always like to, to um, show this cover from Nature from 2011 that talked about ten, the first 10 years with the genome and talking about how the genome sequence and having that information has started to change our approach to medicine. And I really like this figure that was uh, sort of a, uh, a plan, sort of looking forward into the future as to how uh, the understanding of the genome was going to be applied to advancing healthcare. So uh, you can see that we're now living in, in this decade uh, where we're under, we've got a good understanding of, of, of genomes, we're starting to understand the biology of disease and then moving into advancing medicine. Um, and ultimately, uh, the goal beyond 2020 is to use all of this knowledge to improve the effectiveness of healthcare. And congenital anomalies are certainly uh, an important area in which to think about how to apply this type of, of thinking. Um, because they are, they are such an important cause of physical and developmental disability. And as, as most of us uh, think about um, a lot, uh, when we see patients with these types of findings, we, we try to first think about the mechanism of causation. So we think about malformations as being uh, differences in the body that result from a primary abnormality of development that's typically uh, genetic in origin as opposed to deformations and disruptions that we think of as being non-genetic and, and being caused by um, exogenous types of forces, either, either physical forces or disruptive influences like vascular changes or, or amniotic bands. So I'm really going to focus this talk on, on the category of malformations and really major malformations. So, Major congenital malformations are a significant issue. Uh, they affect about two to three percent of newborns. They're involved in, in a lot of hospitalizations for, for patients during their lifetime. Uh, we certainly know that, that just like developmental disabilities, they can be isolated or part of the syndrome. Uh, they're often identified prenatally, and so we know about these before a baby is born a lot of times, and so that, that can give us a an opportunity to, um, uh, to provide information to parents uh, that, that may be important for understanding the prognosis for their child. We certainly know there's a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with congenital malformations of various types. And really this is not just true um, you know, here at home, it's, it's true around the world. This is really a global healthcare issue. And so these uh, examples, just pictures that I pulled off the internet, uh, really just illustrate some of the more severe uh, types of congenital malformations that lead to such significant morbidity and mortality. Um, so congenital diaphragmatic hernia, for example, where you have uh, the uh, abdominal uh, contents, the bowel, herniated through the diaphragm. And, and that can cause babies to have very severe problems at birth. Many babies have to go on ECMO for prolonged periods of time uh, and are very, very sick children. You can obviously see this child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and how sick this child is. And it was always impressed upon me when I was um, in pediatric training and working in the cardiac ICU, seeing children like this and thinking that if we could just figure out what the cause of that heart malformation was, maybe somehow we could prevent all of these 
um, bad things happening to this child. And encephalocele, uh, obviously a very severe uh, malformation of the brain, and uh, just illustrates the fact that there are lots of uh, uh, various brain malformations that can have significant effects for a person throughout their lifetime. So, uh, if we could get to the uh, to a better understanding of the genetic etiology of these malformations, this could be extremely beneficial. Uh, we know that it could give us prognostic information, especially for prenatal cases. So it may be that uh, for a particular type of malformation, a particular version of that malformation, if we knew the genetic cause, that would help us to better understand what the prognosis for that child might be. Uh, part of that information might be an awareness of other associated medical complications or neurodevelopmental issues that that child might be at risk to have. We certainly know that if we can get genetic information, that could help us to very precisely understand the risk of recurrence in families where there has been uh, a, a child or more than one child with a congenital malformation. But I think it's interesting to think about, could we use genetic information to understand the risk of occurrence? Could we identify at-risk couples um, who would have no idea that they have an increased genetic risk to have a baby with a major congenital malformation. And then there's the whole issue of prevention, because uh, as we know, once a baby is born with a, with a congenital malformation, you can't necessarily reverse that unless you do surgery. Uh, but uh, would there be ways to identify at-risk couples, for example, um, and then use preventive strategies to try and prevent the occurrence or the recurrence of a malformation. So we know that uh, current methods, for example, would be pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to use genetic information to do this, but you obviously have to know the exact genetic cause for that to be uh, successful. We know that there are established nutritional strategies. The best example is folic acid for neural tube defect prevention. Uh, but the way I like to think about this is if we could have a better understanding of genetic uh, underpinnings of congenital malformations and the developmental pathways that uh, cause the malformations to happen, perhaps that would give us insight into novel nutritional strategies or molecular strategies, uh, basically as therapies to try to prevent uh, the occurrence or the recurrence of these types of malformations. Um, so, in terms of putting all this in perspective of where we are now, obviously we are now in the genomic era. Um, we're in the midst of the next generation sequencing revolution. And uh, as we know, this really has shifted the paradigm uh, of, of, of you know, how we think about uh, fundamental biological questions and we now think about them on a genome-wide scale. And this is not very up-to-date, but um, but you can just see in this short period of time uh, how many uh, uh, Mendelian disorders have been solved at the genetic level, how many discoveries have been made using this technology. And so it's been extremely powerful for uh, Mendelian conditions. But the problem with uh, isolated congenital malformations, uh, and most of the time they are isolated, is that um, they, they're not inherited in a Mendelian fashion. Most, most of them are thought to have a multifactorial basis. And so the, the uh, idea is very similar to um, how we think about isolated autism, that, that there may be contributions from, from many genes and, and also uh, potentially many non-genetic factors. Uh, we know that, that another problem is that isolated malformations often are sporadic. Uh, they can certainly be present in multiple members of the family and not have traditional Mendelian inheritance, uh, but uh, they're often sporadic. Uh, and then uh, analysis and, and understanding of the genetics is really complicated by um, other factors like incomplete penetrance. So people walking around who carry a genetic predisposition but they don't know it, they don't have any way of knowing that, that they have that. Um, or variable expressivity. Uh, different manifestations of the same malformation in different individuals, e either in the same family or different uh, families. And then uh, there's a lot of attention to lack of uniformity in phenotyping. 
that, uh, that we need to be better and more precise about how we describe uh, malformations so that that can lead to more precise uh, correlation with genetic variants that are found. And so I, I kind of think about the, the issue like this, is that in some cases you might have a family uh, where you have various members of that family um, either manifesting that trait in a Mendelian or a non-Mendelian fashion, but you have variably affected individuals, a person who may be mildly affected, moderately, or more severely affected with the same malformation, or the same basic malformation, uh, and then you have some individuals who carry the genetic risk factor but are non-penetrant, and then out in the general population, you have various individuals scattered throughout the population uh, who are uh, sporadically affected by that malformation, either uh, you know, in various uh, degrees of severity, and you also have people out in the general population um, who are non-penetrant individuals, but who are at risk to have an affected child. So if we want to approach the idea of finding the, the primary genetic alterations that cause these malformations, I think we can certainly think about basing that on what we already know. We already know a lot about um, how uh, different types of genetic mechanisms can lead to um, congenital malformations. We know that there can be um, uh, various ways that this can happen. So if you think about a hypothetical scenario here where you have say a gene for uh, heart development, a gene for, uh, say, uh, brain development, and you have a long distance enhancer that controls the expression of those genes in their uh, target tissues uh, during development. We know that in, in some cases of congenital malformations, we certainly know there can be a single gene alteration, uh, usually a, 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 a sequence alteration in the coding region, and there are a lot of transcription factors involved in development that have, have alterations that have been identified. We certainly know there can be deletions, either of, say, a single gene by itself or contiguous genes, and if you have the contiguous deletions, you might have a more complex phenotype or a recognizable syndrome. And we know that you can have duplications or triplications uh, of genes that can cause congenital malformations. And we also know that you can have uh, situations in which the genes are actually intact. There's no uh, sequence variant, there's, there's no uh, change in dosage, but there's still a change in the way that gene is expressed during development, either because there's a chromosome rearrangement that disrupts the connection with an enhancer, or there is a, um, an alteration in the enhancer itself. So this sort of brings up the you know, the, the issue of uh, how do you find these changes in non-coding uh, sequences. And so just some examples of, of, uh, of these types of mechanisms. Uh, um, we know, for example, that, that various ocular malformations can be caused by alterations in single genes. And so here's an example of, of uh, anophthalmia, microphthalmia spectrum, where you have sequence alterations in a gene called CHEX10. Um, we, we certainly know that, that um, limb malformations can be caused by changes in gene dosage, so split hand foot malformation can be caused by uh, microduplications of chromosome 10. Uh, and this is isolated, this is, this is not associated with other, other findings typically. And uh, we know that uh, preaxial polydactyly can be caused by a, a variant in a long distance enhancer. Um, that affects the expression of the sonic hedgehog gene in the limb. And the enhancer is embedded in an intron of another gene. It's about a megabase away from sonic hedgehog. And so we know that um, there's precedent for finding you know, these types of alterations as the causes of, of major malformations. Um, so important questions we uh, then would, would want to try to address are what are the primary genetic causes of, of various isolated <coughs> malformations for which we don't yet have a cause? Uh, and what are the genetic factors, the modifiers, or the secondary factors that influence uh, penetrance and variability? Um, what, where are the genetic alterations? Are they in genes? Are they in non-coding or enhancer regions? Uh, and when we find genetic variants, 
uh, are we looking for, you know, are, are they going to be small, are they going to be uh, common variants that have small individual effects that have to add up? Or are they going to be rare variants that have large effects or combinations thereof? And um, how do we interpret their significance? Uh, and this would, this would mean we, we might have to study large populations, uh, you might have to do functional analysis of variants that are identified uh, and see how they affect uh, embryonic development. And um, uh, in particular, animal models would be a useful way to do that. Other important questions are, what is the timing or the developmental stage at which gene alterations that cause malformations actually uh, occur? Uh, Certainly, uh, many may occur pre-conception and therefore be able uh, be, be identifiable in the germline of an affected individual, but some may occur post-conception and thus they're in a somatic mosaic state in an affected individual and therefore you would only, uh, you, you might only find that if you pick the right tissue source to, to study. And so that begs the question of what tissue source should be used for, for genetic testing. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the idea of environmental interactions. We, uh, there's a lot we need to understand about how the environment interacts with genetic signaling pathways during development. Uh, how maternal nutrition modulates that, how maternal medications or other exposures uh, affect that, and how epigenetic factors play into all of this. Okay, so there's a lot of questions to be answered. and. Are there ideas or strategies to, to be able to address these questions? Well, um, there are, and there are a lot of different ones, and, and uh, one is the idea of model families. So uh, this, this came out of a, of a paper from 1988 that was sort of thinking about these questions back then when we didn't have all these technologies that we have now, but the same principle still holds that if you can find pedigrees in which you have a very uh, straightforward phenotype that looks purely genetic, that it's Mendelian, um, and looks like the more common polygenic or multifactorial disorder, then that would be a model family. So if you can find families that have isolated major malformations segregating um, in a Mendelian fashion, those would be good ones to study. So this was a family that Dr. Schwartz and I were involved with at one point <clears throat> that was reported uh, in the early 2000s with autosomal dominant omphalocele. And so this would be considered a model family. And uh, we were involved uh, sort of in this stage of the process. And, and eventually what was found uh, was that um, through linkage analysis and, and um, microarray that the affected individuals had a duplication on chromosome 1. So this would be an example of a family that if you came across a family like this, it could be a very good family for understanding uh, the cause potentially of, of isolated um, phallocele. Um, in terms of looking at the, uh, the right tissue, uh, there have been some studies to look for mosaicism in congenital malformation. So here's a, a paper from uh, 2014 that looked at known genes causing um, cortical malformations uh, and looking for mosaicism in the blood. And they were able to find some cases where there were mosaic alterations in the blood uh, in these patients. And uh, they just demonstrated in some of their figures how with next generation sequencing, they might find um, uh, a sequence variant that would be very hard to detect by typical Sanger sequencing um, unless you actually subclone the, the mutant allele. Um, so it, they pointed out that uh, for these patients with malformations, you could detect mosaicism in the blood in some of those patients. And so then that begs the question of, how, you know, what about looking at affected tissue? Maybe there, are, maybe there is a somatic mosaic alteration in the affected tissue uh, in patients with major malformations uh, that arises very early in development. So how would you how would you find that? Well, you would really have to get biopsies or surgically removed and discarded tissue for genetic analysis. So I thought a lot about this for isolated limb malformations, and 
kind of my concept is, well, you know, one idea is you could take biopsies at various levels in an affected limb, or you could get these, for example, these little digital nubbins that if they were surgically removed, that might be a good source for genetic analysis, but you might have to compare what you find in the affected side with uh, what you find in the unaffected side. This approach has obviously been very uh, useful and productive in overgrowth disorders, um, but uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't really been used a lot in, in this type of scenario. And one question is, well, is the genetic alteration that you're looking for in this limb even going to be there? Are, are the cells that had it, are they gone by the time you see this, this child? Um, I will say that uh, uh, the group that, that published on uh, this paper um, has actually used this approach to look uh, at the genetic uh, alterations causing hemimegalencephaly by using brain tissue. So this, this approach is also being used. If you look at the issues of penetrance and variability, how would you address these? Well, um, one thought would be is that if you could find large families uh, or cohorts of unrelated people in, in which you could find multiple affected individuals and some unaffected individuals who all have the same primary genetic alteration, then you could utilize uh, next generation sequencing and other methodologies to look for secondary genetic factors or modifiers that affect clinical expression and penetrance. And I think we now have the capability to do this with the technology. It's just a matter of applying it to, to some of the, the families and cases. And then the idea of, uh, of studying gene-environment interactions is, is an important one. This is a really interesting paper that um, um, was published uh, this year, where they looked at a, uh, the GLE2 gene. In, in mice, and GLEE2 is involved in the hedgehog signaling pathway, and um, heterozygous changes in this gene, you knock out one copy in the mouse, the, the mice, some of the mice, uh, will uh, develop signs of polyprosencephaly, both facially and in the brain. And um, if you give mice this, this uh, teratogen called bismodigib, some of them will develop uh, polyprosencephaly, uh, but if you combine the two together, so and then you, you adjust the dose of the teratogen, what you see is that here are mice that just have the GLEE2 uh, alteration. Um, here are mice that have uh, normal copies of GLEE2 that are, that are given the teratogen. And then here are the mice that have a GLEE2 alteration and the teratogen uh, together. Um, so, um, and actually I should say, these are, the, these are mice that, uh, that have the alteration with a lower dose of, of the teratogen. So, uh, but the point is really that um, the combination of those two factors uh, is, uh, can, can have a significant effect on expression of the phenotype. So, um, uh, these various types of strategies and others have been used in congenital heart disease because that's, this is the most common congenital malformation. It's the largest cause of malformation in, uh, uh, related infant mortality. And um, this, this is just one example. These strategies are being applied to many different malformations at this point. But uh, the American Heart Association recognizes the importance of genetic diagnosis. Um, we know that with heart uh, uh, Defect, the same sort of idea applies. There's, there's thought to be a, a large genetic component, but with multifactorial inheritance. And so there are various uh, articles in the literature kind of looking at, at the current landscape of, of understanding different malformations. So I just picked one that looked at cardiovascular malformations. And when you read through some of these papers, you find that there, there have been successful strategies. Uh, for example, uh, if you do research on copy number variants and syndromic forms of heart disease, uh, that has led to the identification of important genes for heart development and, and, and congenital heart, uh, uh, isolated congenital heart disease, like these genes in, in these microdeletion syndromes. We know CMVs play a role in heart disease. Um, gene panels that um, where we know a certain group of genes that has been linked to heart disease. If you apply these to isolated congenital heart disease, you can find rare pathogenic variants in various genes. And now really whole exome sequencing is being applied to look at trios uh, 
and look for de novo variants in various studies. In the heart literature, they also talk about systems biology, understanding the transcriptional and signaling networks that contribute to heart development, much like the, um, the figure that, that EJ showed with all of the genes interacting with one another, trying to understand the, the basic pathways of heart development. And then there's some em emphasis on deep phenotyping, uh, meaning very comprehensive and precise uh, analysis of phenotypes. And an emphasis on using more precise methods and classification schemes to really describe and standardize phenotypes. And just as an example, if you wanted to look for the genetic basis of a ventricular septal defect, not, not, not all ventricular septal defects are the, are the same. So you really have to figure out um, how they phenotypically differ in order to correlate the genetic findings with them. Um, so, so these efforts are really important for genotype-phenotype correlation. And then there's the whole idea of, of birth defect uh, registries uh, and an increasing need to gather better phenotypic data and, and combine this with genomic data. Um, and so it really necessitates change in which registry, in, which, in the ways uh, that the registries are designed and, and implemented. And this concept is, is mentioned in this paper of public health genomics as an eventual sort of way to institute prevention programs for congenital malformations based on um, knowledge of their genetic causes. So uh, to finish up, I just wanted to show you just an, an example of collaborative efforts uh, at the NIH to look at congenital malformations. There's a program, uh, that, uh, a working group that was put together called the Trans-NIH Structural Birth Defects Working Group. It's part of the, Child, the Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And you can go online and you can look at some of their um, some of their material. And I wanted just to show you uh, this was a report from a 2014 workshop, and you can see um, some of the folks who spoke there that we know well in the in the genetic world, um, where there was this discussion about how do we approach all of these issues. And so there were kind of four main topics that were discussed. Number one how good are experimental model systems for human congenital anomalies? And um, one point was that they're critical, and a counterpoint was that, well, they're not really exactly, um, you know, uh, uh, correct model for humans, that there's a lot of important things we have to learn from studying humans as opposed to studying model sy systems. The second topic was what's the preferred method to find the genetic etiologies? One point is that association studies are a good approach. The other point was, no, we need to be doing genome-wide sequencing or exome sequencing, uh, especially using um, trios and looking for de novo variants. The third topic was, how valuable will epigenomics be? And <clears throat> you can see that um, one point was that um, um, it, it's impractical. Another point was it's uh, very important. Um, and then the fourth topic was uh, are epidemiological approaches suitable for answering questions about risk factors and preventive factors for human birth defects? And again, there were different, different sort of perspectives on that in terms of the utility. So uh, really I think, you know, this just kind of gives us a flavor for uh, all the opportunity, but all the challenges that we have to understand malformations, just like we, we have, we face the same issues with uh, intellectual disabilities and autism. Um, so, um, so really the, the, the take home messages are that congenital malformations are a major healthcare issue in need of improved understanding, that the causation is likely to be very complex. And, but that genomic research initiatives really have great potential to make a major impact on how we understand etiologies and how we might think about improving uh, prevent, prevention strategies. So um, with that, I'll stop and take any questions.